The Unshackled Waves, episode 246. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, welcome to another Waves episode. At The Unshackled as part of our continuous expansion, we've welcomed aboard a few new contributors. One of them is Aidan Green, who also operates the Commentariat, where he produces commentary videos and articles about current global events with a particular focus on the Trump era in the United States. He's studied international relations at university and has also traveled widely around the world. He has also worked in the mainstream media, so he has had quite the life experience at such a young age. I thought it was about time time to introduce him to you properly and have him on the show. Aidan, welcome to the show and welcome to The Unshackled. Thanks for having me on, Tim. Now, your main area of interest in news is international affairs. Now, I just wanted to start by asking, uh, did this develop when you were young or at university? Where did sort of this fascination come from? Um, probably, de- probably not when I was young. I think uh, it, it developed more. So when I was 18, I, I moved over to England to play cricket uh, and I stayed there for two years. And then uh, I came back and from there, I kind of uh, developed a bit of a travel bug. And then I decided to move to Canada for two years. And I think that's around the around the time of when I was 21 was when I started to um, start getting a bit more into politics and, and culture and, and the world that we live in and then um, so I spent two years there and then after those four years of travel I decided to uh, then start university and then actually um, take on international relations and international studies at territory level. Uh, so when you were young, it's, it's, it's fair to say you were just more interested in gaining life experience, uh, you travelled widely, uh, What uh, you mentioned England, where else have you travelled to? Uh, I've traveled to uh, every continent in the world, uh, about maybe 40 countries total. Um, but I also lived in France when I did uh, exchange in 2017, so about two years ago now, uh, which was which was fantastic. Yeah, I think it's important to travel. I think it really makes you realize um, a lot about yourself and a lot, a lot about the people around you and just how, I don't know, I guess we're kind of insignificant in a way, but as a collective, um, we're, we're definitely not. Yeah. Cause believe it or not, I've only ever been in Australia and New Zealand, which are a similar country as I've never, uh, gone on that sort of life journey overseas, but I see it every day on the, on the news, uh, uh, what's happening over there. What are the issues there? But what's it actually, what do you, did you observe on the ground in, in those countries? Is it a different sort of culture and sort of way, way of seeing the world? Yeah, definitely. I think it depends on which country you travel in, uh, in which you're in, because all, all cultures are a little bit different. Um, I think France, for instance, um, their politics was a lot different to England and, and Canada. Canada was, was similarly uh, polarised to um, America with their left and right, Republican, Democrat. Um, but with France, it was very much... Um, like a socialist democratic state, uh, lots of protests, uh, everyone involved, uh, totally different to, to England. Um, but I think one thing you do, uh, gather from traveling to all these nations and living in these nations is that everyone's really kind of pissed off, I think with politics just in general and everyone, it's just really common that people feel disenfranchised with the, with politics and especially politicians. But I think I try and um, tell people to maybe not be so uh, against politicians and more it's the system itself, I think, that is broken. Because a lot of these politicians are actually, you know, doing a, a lot of work and a lot of public service. Just and they genuinely want they genuinely want to help. 
I'd probably disagree with that myself. I mean, if a politician wants to make a, a positive change that the people want, they, they can. Uh, the, the way our system is, is set up is the majority plus one gets to, to make the laws and uh, set the, uh, the policy uh, direction. And so I've, I definitely feel that we've been more let down by our leaders in the Western world, especially in Europe. Uh, I guess it depends. Um, I think in Australia you have it's just like labor or liberal, so it's basically liberal. Um, so it's basically we almost just have one government. Uh, whereas in Europe you do actually have the chance to push through uh, either left wing, right wing, far right, far left, uh, socialist. Um, you can pretty much you do have a stake in the claim with the way that their their systems work. Uh, I think in France they have about. Um, nine really strong politicians um, debating for oh, at least a week and then that gets cut down to five and then it goes from five and then it goes to two and um, anything can happen in European politics. So I think you do have that sort of freedom for anything to happen in those places. But in Australia, I, I don't feel that way at all. I think if you're not um, in the mainstream political realm, then you don't you don't have a chance. Yeah, with Australia, it's because we've got a parliamentary system with uh, single member electorates. That that means that we're used to one of the the major two parties having a majority at least in in the in the lower house. And the best minor parties can do to to break through is in the Senate. But as we've seen with every sort of minor party, which everyone thinks is going to be big, mm -hmm. it always implodes with. You know the the new MPs, you know, getting a big head and sort of leaving and going out on their own, and then uh, by the end of the the term in Parliament, uh, it's it's fallen apart. Yeah, oh, definitely. I think one of the only reasons that people really vote for smaller parties in Australia is knowing that they might put a bit of influence. Um, I myself, I usually vote for minor minor parties, knowing that they won't get in. Um, but just because I think they might actually have a bit of influence on the on Labor or Liberal, whoever's in power. Yeah. Now, as you mentioned, you went to university later on. You went to the, the University of Wollongong. Uh, uh, now, everyone sort of claims that, you know, their university is the the worst, but it's sort of, it's, they're, they're all pretty much the same. I've sort of heard a few stories about sort of activism at the, the University of, of Wollongong. Yeah, I, th I think University of Wollongong is actually one of those universities that actually say they're the best. Um, <laughs> they don't really go around saying they're the worst. They um, definitely have a heck of a lot of activism, um, which is, you know, not, it's good to see that people are involved, uh, especially in political terms. Um, but yeah, Wollongong definitely has, they, they definitely do have a lot of pride uh, for their university. It's, it's probably, the, it's, the staple for probably Wollongong itself now, it's now the um, leading economic um, producer ahead of uh, the coal terminal and, and BHP and things like that because it used to be such a uh, labour, you know, working class city, uh, so much so that you don't even, Liberal doesn't even contest down here, it's, it's just out of labour and the Greens. Yeah, the, the two seats there, Whitlam and Cunningham, they're just such safe Labour seats. And it's interesting that, you know, you mentioned the sort of coal-heavy industry in Wollongong and the, the Illawarra, despite Labour, you know, embracing the climate change uh, agenda and wanting to, to phase out coal, people of Wollongong still voting Labour. Yeah. Yeah, it is interesting. Uh, I... Personally, think that it would, Wollongong would probably be a lot better if uh, Liberal did some contesting down here, because then at least you'd get a bit of push for something, um, something different or a bit more initiative and activism from uh, Liberal down here to actually um, create, like, make them do more. Because it is such a safe seat, we probably do get left behind. Um, but it's still, <laughs> we're still doing pretty well. It's still a great city. I'm, I'm proud to say I'm from from Wollongong for sure. Now, the University of Wollongong, they, they tried to um, 
Oh, they were looking at I introducing or uh, setting up a Ramsey Center for Western Civilization, which is this uh, bequest uh, set up uh, uh, trying to get uh, Western Civilization courses at Australian universities. They've tried it a few universities with with no success so far uh, it's always the the local academics and activists you know claim that you know this degree is you know racist and you know white white history and uh, the same thing happened at uh, Wollongong yeah it absolutely did uh, and I think the only reason it got through is because our vice chancellor um, fast-tracked it at the middle of the night when he knew that a lot of the um, academics that were 100% going to oppress the idea. Uh, he just he pushed it straight through, and it's it is going ahead. It's it's gonna. I think it starts in 2020, um, but there's been a lot of backlash from it. There's been protests. It's been all over the news. Um, I yeah, I wrote an article about it, and it it went quite viral. Um, so yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot going on. To be it's a big story for the little the little town in of Wollongong. Yeah. Yeah, oh, well, it's good that it's finally found a, a home, and it shouldn't be controversial to uh, s study, you know, because we are here today because of Western civilization, but the, the, the left who control most of the universities believe that it's the, the birthplace Western civilization of all oppression and... Uh, uh, violence and, and bloodshed, even though that the, the peace and the standard of living that we enjoy today is because of Western civilization, the places that don't have Western civilization, uh, Africa and the Middle East, you know, that's where human rights aren't respected and where there's still civil wars. Well, yeah, that's 100% correct. And I think that's basically what I touched on in my article. And I myself copped a lot of backlash uh, for literally just stating stating facts about how women's rights are the highest in uh, Western civilization, so as minorities. Um, and, you know, the Western invented the scientific, scientific method, uh, the abolition of slavery. Um, the West, we have a lot to be proud of. And, yeah, it, like you said, it's not a controversial uh, thing to say that you, we appreciate the world that, w that we live in and that we've grown up in. Um, but going on from that, I... I posted the article on it on a UAW buy and sell um, site full of, you know, obviously full of a, a left wing crowd, and the, the amount of hate that I copped was uh, was quite funny. I think it got up to about a hundred comments, um, but, but it only reiterated my point and made it quite clear that the left that the universities are left wing, and um, it only proved my point further, really. What was it like in the, the classroom itself? Because obviously some uh, conservative right-wing students, especially in the humanities, find it difficult to sort of, you know, speak up about their views in the classroom because they don't want to get marked down by the lecturer or shouted down by their, their fellow classmates. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Um, I think maybe because I was a bit older and because I did um, have so many years living in the West that I was quite happy with, you know, kind of standing up for the West or just not not going along with the politically correct narrative that we would all sit there and say, you know, post-colonial, talk about post-colonialism or identity politics and the, the post-modern narrative. I would just, yeah, you would, it would be awkward because they're probably out of a class of, you know, 20 politics students, there probably only would be two or three that were conservative or even considered conservative thought. And the lecturers themselves, I think I only came across one or maybe a two that you would think, I'm not quite sure where he leans on the political spectrum, whereas most lecturers were just far, you know, so left wing that if you even questioned it or answered it, you'd, yeah, you'd get scoffs or eye rolls and things like that. Yeah, oh, well, that's not too bad, but yeah, it's it's sort of the standard, and sadly, uh, what, what's to be expected? Yeah, and I think that's this is why the range degree is quite important because it's going to just balance out politic political speech a bit more and balance out the thought process because um, it is completely dominated and 
it's not just Australia, it's all Western nations. Um, and then Jordan Peterson's spoken about this for, well, I don't know, 10, 10, 20 years. And now he's actually opening up his own university because of it. So, you know, when you block out conservative speech for so long and you block out conservative thought, other universities will emerge and, and other think tanks emerge. And it's what we're seeing now. And, and you could even go further with that with what Facebook's doing and the, the rise of other social media platforms. When you just silence people, that people don't remain silent. They they go and find other avenues to say their, their speech. And it's not it's not even the controversial speech. It's just it's something that we need. You know, it's not like everyone votes left wing. It's not like we just have left wing parties. The silent majority, you know, actually owns the realm of politics when it goes to the voting. Um, you want to go to the polls? Yeah. Look at all the recent elections in. Uh, the US, yes. uh, Australia, and the UK. I mean, the the conservative movement has has always won, and it's always come as you know a big shock to the the, the media and the the cultural class. Uh, but you know, despite all of this like indoctrination and you know preaching at and you know finger wagging, uh, pe people when they get into the the, uh, the ballot box, they still believe that. You know, right-wing parties are the most, you know, responsible to deliver economic stability and um, social cohesion. Yeah, I think a lot of you know, the younger people are more focused on just appearing nice or, you know, it's a competition of who can be have more moral, moral standards or who can virtue signal the highest. But when it comes down to voting at the polls, um, yeah, people end up just voting, voting conservative most of the time. Well, one of the the greatest examples of that was the the election of Donald Trump as as president in in twenty sixteen. That uh, the, the Trump phenomenon was one of the things that motivated me to to start the Unshackle because I was uh, before he came along quite disillusioned with uh, politics. But then you know Trump came along and he was just putting the establishment to to shame. And yeah, it was like, I I came to the the conclusion that you just need to tear the political political establishment and down and it was just you know hugely entertaining and of course uh, when he won that was the the mass triggering from the, the the left and the not my president rallies and where we what was your initial thoughts where when he ran for president and sort of what how, how did you observe it as it gained steam the Trump phenomenon I think I was maybe um a bit blind like everyone else. I think back then I was, probably was still believing in the mainstream media, but I always had in the back of my head um, Brexit. That was kind of the first shattering of the uh, the anti-establishment movement that we see going on around the world. Um, and then yeah, he kind of just he kind of just hung in there. He kept winning. He kept kept using quick wit. And um, I think the, one of the main things was which I kind of liked about him was the fact that he wasn't a politician and. What I found, everyone was saying, oh, you know, like, I'm so sick of politicians, you know, I'm just, um, I'm so over him, I don't want to vote for him, I don't trust him. And then Donald Trump comes along, who isn't a politician, doesn't act like a politician, and then gets voted in and then everyone just hates him. Like, it's, you can't play, you just can't play some people, I think, at the end of the day. Now, everyone was predicting when uh, Donald Trump uh, got elected president that oh, I'd be a disaster for America, the economy would implode, that uh, he'd be impeached within uh, six, uh, six months. But it's over two years on now, and the, the US economy has never been stronger. And every time uh, the, the media have tried to predict the end of the Trump presidency, or oh, this is definitely going to be the the beginning of the end now it's it's the the media that cried wolf and you've done a few videos like rationally analyzing his presidency and you know basically basically he he's been able to f like fulfill most of his promises and also manage uh the united states government and economy quite well yeah absolutely i think when you actually look at him objectively and um put all the, the bullshit aside, uh, you actually find that he's doing incredibly well. I think it was unemployment's at 
3.7%, which is the lowest in 50 years. Uh, female unemployment was down to 60, uh, the lowest in 65 years. African American unemployment was the lowest, I think, ever, like ever on, on record. Uh, Asian and Hispanic was also the lowest ever on record. So the whole country is doing better. Minor minorities are doing better. Um, there's no impeachment. There's no impeachment coming. Uh, he's definitely going to get voted in again in 2020. So I'd re I'm really interested to see what actually does happen with um, mainstream media and the in the left when when we're going on into that you know fourth, fifth, sixth year of Trump. Are they really going to be peddling conspiracies and I think the other day it came out that they were um, pushing that uh, how it was a, a fraud that lost a, a billion dollars back in the 90s. But that's something that they're clutching at straws, um, and it's getting quite it's getting quite embarrassing, really. When Trump was uh, running for president, there was a whole lot of Republicans who were never Trumpers. They they thought Trump was a menace to the Republican Party, but now he's got an 80% approval rating among registered uh, Republicans and uh, all the, the polling is indicating that he's uh, doing much better than other presidents uh, during uh, their first term in office and there's a uh, Melbourne Cup field of uh, Democrats who want to run against uh, Trump and most of them are the, the intersectionality uh, candidates uh, because that's who's taken over the Democratic Party but it's uh, quite ironic that the front runners Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders uh, are old white men supposedly the enemies of progressivism <laughs> actually that's a um, that's a pretty good point I didn't really think of it like like that I guess that is just the uh, hypocrisy of the left in itself right there um, I do think if Bernie Sanders I think Bernie Sanders was the only person that really has a chance because uh, he was quite anti-establishment um, and I feel as if I feel that when um, back in the election when Trump was running against um, the Democrats the moment when um, was which was Hillary's downfall was not making Bernie Sanders her, her, her vice president um, and then I, f I think a lot of those anti-establishment voters that were going to Bernie Sanders kind of said Oh, stuff this! I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna go and vote for Trump. And now that Trump's doing well, the Democrat Party is just in. That, it looks like they're in absolute disarray. There's probably only, I mean, maybe even AOC is mm. uh, acting like a, <laughs> I don't know, complete, mo just making a complete mockery of herself. Yeah, I mean, they they did win the the House of Representatives, the the Democrats in the the midterms. Uh, uh, but yeah, yeah uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, you know, the the future of the Democratic Party with a green new deal and uh, the, the fact that she says things like oh it's it's not important to be factual um you only just have to be moral and the 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 fact that she sounds like just so stupid and it actually it makes uh, like the old guard like nancy pelosi the house speaker actually look you know more level-headed oh absolutely and she just plays way too much into identity politics um I think I saw a video the other day of her speaking in, um, in I think Brooklyn it was, in front of a majority African American crowd, and she totally changed her accent, <laughs> sound as if she was a black person, which is just the epitome of um, patronization. And if some, if if Donald Trump went and did that to an African American crowd, you could just imagine the absolute uproar. But just because it's coming from the left, it's acceptable. Yeah, I recall Hillary did that as well. Yes, yeah, she did. I, I featured it in one of my, my videos. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's it, it, it just goes to show that it's the, the left who, like, they're, they're the, like, the real purveyors of racism. Like, they're the ones who see people as, you know, all members of different tribes who need to be treated differently. Yeah, well, that's exactly right. They, they see everything through a lens, and, and then whilst you're looking through that lens, it's like, well, my lens says that you have to think this way, or you have to behave this way, or you have to vote this way. Um, and luckily, we do have things like Blegs that are actually kind of shattering the politically correct narrative and the breaking the shackles of the way that people think and uh, the simulation of fear that is instilled 
by the left, um, and it, it could actually it could actually happen, Blexit, um, the removal of, of African Americans from the Democratic Party moving over to the Republican Party and voting. I think um, he received 40% in a Rasmussen poll in October just last year, which is the highest ever by a Republican president in the history of the nation. And that is absolutely remarkable. Like, in terms of anything, that is remarkable. But you would not hear it on mainstream news. You will not find it in a newspaper. You'll only find it on, on the internet. Well, Donald Trump, he's hes not a racist. He never has been. I mean, when he was a celebrity businessman, like, he, he used to associate with black celebrities all the time. He's had heaps of, like, black senior executives at his Trump organizations. There's absolutely no evidence for that. It's, it's, it's just the, the usual, you know, hysteria that, oh, you know, because he wants, you know, strong borders, a, a, a border wall that, oh, he must be a racist. I think that's one thing that the left doesn't realize is that patriotism, patriotism doesn't see any color, uh, but the left truly does. Uh, and going on from Trump not being seen as a racist, he featured in 67 chart topping um, hip hop hits before he was president. So he was absolutely praised by African Americans before he ran for presidency. So I don't know why they would praise a racist. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like you don't just magically become racist when you're a Republican. Yeah. And of course, the, the main thing they've tried to get him on the, the media is the, the Russian collusion thing. And we had the, the Mueller uh, special counsel investigation, which, you know, found, you know, no collusion, no obstruction of justice. Like there was, there was never anything. The, the only thing they sort of found was, you know, pe like associates of his had spoken to people who were connected to the Russian government, which would happen in political circles all the time. Yeah, yeah, like nothing that was uh, out of the ordinary. And if you put a lens on, or well, if you actually investigated Trump, uh, uh, sorry, Hillary, as hard as you just invested, uh, in investigated Trump, you're going to find a hell of a lot more uh, problems. You know, that's where that's where crooked Hillary really comes into it. Uh, but she still hasn't been the the, the two promises that uh, Donald Trump hasn't fulfilled is the the border wall and locking Hillary Clinton up. Yeah, I think locking Hillary Clinton up would be quite difficult. I, the border wall is underway. Um, parts of it is is happening, uh, but there's now that the uh, House of Reps is majority Democrat, it's going to be uh, quite difficult to get funding. Yeah. And uh, his biggest cheerleader, uh, Ann Coulter, she's saying that if the border wall's not built, the, the Trump presidency will have been uh, uh, just a joke. Yeah, Ann Coulter says a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> well, probably the other big uh, climactic uh, geopolitical event of the, the past few years has been Brexit. That was sort of the first... Uh, event which, which sort of showed that the the right was on the resurgence, but it's three years on and Brexit hasn't been delivered. Well, Theresa May, she's she's now going to resign because she hasn't been able to uh, deliver it. That just shows that the the left they can still do their best to stifle the the will of the people, even if it is a a democratic vote. Yeah, it's it's quite bizarre that. Um what the left can get away with compared to the right itself. Uh, I, I was actually in England when UKIP got its first seat back in 2012. And that was, um, that at the time was massive, massive news that the right was kind of um, coming, you know, that, that resurgence. It, yeah, it happened way back in 2012 when they won that seat and then move on where I was in 2009, yeah, Brexit. 2019, you have um, UKIP has several, you know, several uh, seats in Parliament, and then a Brexit party that's only been around for six weeks comes in and completely shatters the MEP elections for for the European Union. So uh, it looks like Brexit is definitely uh, going ahead, and Marine Le Pen of France was 
voted in as well. So France will probably frags it. Uh, Italy will probably go as well. Um, and the European will probably be obsolete in just a few years, I think. Now, we're both in the, the alternative media, um, and we've, we've done a lot of commentary on how the, the mainstream media, corporate legacy media, is um, dying. Uh, you actually have had some work experience with the mainstream media. What was that like? Uh, yeah, I actually quite enjoyed it. Um, it's, a, it's a lot more um, on than... It still is the trusted, the fourth state as as we have it at the moment. Uh, things are slowly changing. Um, I think Fairfax uh, recently just sold, I think, six or seven papers in um, in Australia. The Illawarra Mercury, one of them, uh, they originally bought it for something like a, a few billion, and they recently just sold it for uh, only three hundred million. So just the amount of money that is going, being taken away from uh, newspapers and mainstream media is quite large. So I've have kind of I don't I I'm not sure where I will and where I will be in ten years, but um, for the meantime I have kind of chosen media just because it's a bit more a bit more freedom and I can um, make my videos and commentate on whatever I want and be my own boss risk but I think they say a lot more risk comes a lot more reward in the long run yeah I've uh, haven't worked in the mainstream media but uh, I know like how it works is that you know when you know you're a journalist in a in a major uh, corporation you know you're you're given assignments by the editor you have to like cover what he instructs you to do you you know you can't really put your own spin on things it's very much you sort of you're given a, a quota and you you're just sort of churning it out uh, yeah you definitely do have to pump out the articles and you don't always get to decide what you want to write about um, and you do have to obviously stay ones of the letterhead um, and there is that underlining tone of I think Fairfax is a little bit left and News Corp is a little bit right mm. you're never really going to go outside those lines you're never really going to take any risks mainstream media takes absolutely no risks whatsoever um, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, that's up for debate. Um, but yeah, I, I still had fun. I still, I still enjoyed it for sure. Mm. Yeah, I've noticed um, the the two mainstream media journalists that uh, they were with News Corp initially, Samantha Maiden and Peter Van Onselen, when they were quite sort of they were right leaning. But now that they've left, Peter Van Onselen's with Network Ten, and Samantha Maiden's with the New Daily, which is a union aligned uh, online newspaper. They're now all of their commentary is really hard to the left, and it's just it, it, it's just interesting that sort of they they sort of. Like even though they are like good journalists, they they still towed the sort of like corporate line. I think all journalists at the end of the day, I think money talks. Um, I think if you tell anyone, any journalist, you know you got you're going to have to write this way. I think with it being such a hard industry to get into and a, a, almost a dying art, there aren't too many journalists that do kind of take that independent route and and do take the risk to go online and live off things like Patreon and donations in itself because it is so risky. So, yeah, I guess some journalists do kind of sell their souls. Well, before the, the internet media age, newspapers could rely on all the revenue from the, the classifieds. The television could rely on all the, the, the ads from like the, the major corporations. It was, they were your only options. Like, uh, print or broadcast media, but with the the internet and the fact that information could now be accessed for for free, like you didn't have to pay uh, a dollar for the for the newspaper every day, uh, you you could just go online, and so and also with the Google and Facebook, they've basically 
consumed all of the the online ads i mean all most businesses now just advertise on those two platforms and with the classifieds now you have like all the jobs are on seek.com.au uh, there's other online classifieds that's just drained their revenue right down yeah oh, absolutely they're just taking pretty much all the revenue and that's why journalism is a dying art that's why it's hard to make a bang for your buck online because it, it there is just they are just taking everything um right up, up against the top but you know things are changing um i think we see a lot with the facebook uh censorship that's going on a daily basis uh this censorship of right-wing commentators cannot really go on for too much longer i'm surprised that it's even gone on this long i'm surprised that mainstream media hasn't actually put its foot down yet and started to actually give everyday citizens this information because a lot of people uh a lot of my friends or just everyday person they have no idea what is actually going on and the scale of how big this is in the history of human civilization like we have never gone through humans have never gone through something where a, a, a private entity has owned over three billion people's social media accounts and essentially decided that we're just going to be left wing like we're only going to put out information that's left wing like that we thought stalin what stalin was doing bad but this is this is on an even grander scale and because they're doing it because silicon valley is left and because they think that um hate speech is a real thing or basically anything that they disagree with is being shut down that that, that it's okay and it's not and the, the the legacy media now they're reliant on facebook and and google for for most of their their traffic i mean it's such a uh, so many people are on it now that now to you know remain competitive uh these corporate media they've got to have a major presence on the the social media uh, outlets um but the also as i mentioned the the main problem is is that now people with the internet they're used to getting their the news and information for free they they don't feel that they should pay for it like through subscription but that's the only way it's it's going to survive if you want journalism you, you're you're going to have to pay for it obviously news corporation they've got a pretty pretty strong paywall i think all of their websites except for news.com.au is paywalled fairfax have like on their websites 30 free articles a month it's sort of a bit more liberal than that but it's uh that's going to have to be the the model uh sort of pay-per-view yeah it kind of looks like it is going that way i really hope it doesn't because people seem to be having less and less money every day and the the gap between the rich and the poor does actually seem to be getting only bigger so i know that people like my like university students for one definitely aren't going to be paying for any information um only people that can afford it will be paying for any for information so then you're going to have a bit of an intellectual gap uh for you know in trusted journalism and, and actual information that you know is, is genuine and real and has actually been funded to actually go out and find that story um so i'm hoping that that is not the way of the future i'm hoping something else changes um maybe a new platform emerges where everyone everyone goes on that and the ads that are generated are actually enough to to fund journalism again because just the way that it's going at the moment it's really hard to predict and i actually don't think subscriptions is the answer i, I can't see someone even like myself who reads every day paying for several subscriptions off multiple from multiple sources it's just it doesn't make sense maybe we can have like a netflix kind of thing where i can get or you know new york times on one or um fairfax on news call and things like that on the other but single-handed subscriptions i just no i, I really think that's i don't think that's going to happen 
going back to you mentioned the the deplatforming because like a lot of YouTubers they were able to get a lot of revenue uh, from YouTube ads, but then um, there was the mass demonetization of of their channels because of like uh, controversial content. Like Lauren Southern's videos got uh, uh, got demonetized. So did Rebel Media's, and so then everyone like sort of turned to Patreon to you know, which is a crowdfunding. Uh, well, we're talking about subscription uh, based platform, but now Patreon and PayPal they've joined the the deplatforming movement, and so not only are right wing and conservative people being like denied the ad revenue now, but now the even ability to to get people to support them financially. Yeah, I I did not know that they actually not even allowing Patreon. That's Oh, that is absolutely uh, bizarre that they're actually stopping someone from giving their money to a journalist is, I don't know, it's beyond me. Yeah, Sargon of Akkad, he uh, got banned from Patreon, so did Milo, uh, Lauren Southern, uh, Faith Goldie, uh, there's a whole list of them. Yeah, I think I just... Um, just shows just how far, way too far the left have gone. Um, when you actually, you know, it, it kind of all is to do with Trump and the election of Trump back in 2016 that now they, they have so much hate for the right that they'll actually, um, companies now are actually decide to be political. Like we see Nike doing it. We see uh, Gillette. Um, being political, it's almost become normal that companies decide to be political. But I always imagine companies to be capitalists, and I can't imagine YouTube, the YouTube boardroom, and them sitting in that room and saying, "Oh, okay, guys. Um, well, how can we make more money? Oh, I know. Uh, let's demonetize half of everyone's political thought." It's absolutely ludicrous, and it's one of the most bizarre things it's actually quite fascinating and I, I love learning about it and i love writing about it because it really is so bizarre that they would actually put political thought over capitalism itself well we saw in australia during the the same-sex marriage postal survey pretty much all the major corporations supported their the yes campaign i don't think there was one that you know dared uh, uh say no and like there are also like all corporations have their corporate social responsibility like uh, they support you know indigenous constitutional recognition of course the biggest one is you know Qantas they support pretty much all the uh, progressive causes and with this deplatforming by the major corporations one wonders where where it stops like is you know a bank going to close down your account because they don't like your political views is a telco going to disconnect you because they don't like your views well, that does happen, um, but I think I, I read one uh, a satire article the other day. It was actually quite funny, and it kind of made uh, put a bit of realization into just how far these things are going. It was uh, we need to continue to silence these commentators. We need to continue to throw milkshakes at them. And then the last sentence was um, we, in fact, uh, we need to start killing them. Mm -hmm. We need to actually start killing these people. <laughs> Where do you draw the line? Like when you can't even buy things and when you you are absolutely segregated from society you know what what does have we're not far off an acid attack or uh, an attack by antifa that goes too far like it definitely could happen and it, it probably will when once trump gets re-elected in 2020 I, uh, all the like lefties say, oh, it's just an egg, it's just a, a milkshake. But like all these assaults, a uh, enabled, encouraged, excused, and so you, you're giving like inspiration for people to to go further. And we saw like in the United States, a Republican congressman, Steve Scalise, he uh, was sh was shot at a baseball game. He like he ha he was in a critical condition. Uh, like hospitals, so it has escalated from just an egg and a milkshake. Yeah, I'm pretty sure a British politician was um, killed last year as well. 
so it it does happen, and you know if we if we're excusing violence just because the left are doing it, then really like what where are we getting it? Where are we getting our morals from? <laughs> yeah, I I, de I definitely I think we're at a an important crossroads, but. The, the internet is also, it's a, it's a beacon of freedom, like, you know, they, they can censor all they want, but they can't unperson people online, there's free speech social media, there's Minds, Gab, MeWe, there's, there, there's all different alternatives, if you try to kick somebody off Facebook or something else, then something else pops up. Yeah, that is the case, um, but at the moment, it's, Facebook is the complete monopoly it's, it's become a utility um so until all these other platforms do pick up it really is it's just a massive um a breach of power in my opinion now what do you see as the the future uh, trends obviously in australia we just had a federal election where everyone was surprised that the the coalition was uh, re-elected, Labor took uh, quite a far-left agenda to the election, which was rejected. So far, they they haven't indicated that they've learned anything. They've just blamed our, oh, you know, vested interests and people didn't understand our, our great policies. Do you, do you sort of see Australia, like, because I was concerned at the beginning of the year, the direction that we were heading, but I've become a bit more uh, measured in sort of my expectations. I uh, actually predicted Scott Morrison's uh, victory. I think I read a few articles on it, um, even when he was paying four dollars months out. You just know that I think there were several reasons why they lost it, but the main one was probably just the fact that the way that Australia people uh, Australians vote, they don't really vote for the party; they actually vote for the preferred leader. And if you looked at the polls throughout. You know, years before it was Scott Morrison was always the uh, the preferred prime minister out of the two. People just did not like the way that Shorten carried on. They didn't like how awkward he was. They didn't like his zingers. Uh, he was just not seen as a leader. Um, so that I predict, even when it was, I think it was eight, it got up to eight dollars in the morning of. I think, yeah, that's how out of. That's one way that you can see how out of touch the mainstream media is, is that he was paying $8 in the morning of, Bill Shorten was paying $1.30, and bookies were paying out the win for Bill Shorten. Yeah, like, yeah, I couldn't believe that. Who, who political pundits? You know, why, why do they still have a job? <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's, I mean, every all the, the the commentators were predicting a Labor win. All the polls were as well. That was a big thing. The 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 polls were were all wrong. I think the polls being wrong is a it's quite common now. You you'd almost have to predict your own poll on the poll being wrong. <laughs> well, there's a lot of us on the right who've like we mentioned the the betting markets have become quite wealthy over these shock results because we've always betted against what the the commentators bookmakers and polls have said and won big yeah well i, I think i had money on donald trump's win and that was uh four dollars fifty in the morning of and that was a crushing victory <laughs> And obviously, you said you believe that Trump's uh, going to be re-elected. I certainly think that there's no no inspiring Democrat uh, candidate. I think the sort of big question is going to be where Europe goes, whether uh, the new British Prime Minister will actually deliver a proper Brexit, and if that final eventuation, you know, inspires nationalists on the European continent to sort of follow. Yeah, yeah, no, I definitely do think the European Union will either be uh, totally obsolete or quite different with uh, more Eastern European nations because they've actually had to get nations to join the Union because England's going to Brexit. That's, you know, that's done and dusted. The, the latest vote for the MEPs with uh, Brexit, uh, Brexit Party absolutely crushing it. 
they will be out and uh, Marine Le Pen winning in France and also Italy, um, their latest election was a coalition of uh, conservative and far right. So they're looking to italics it. So they're looking to get out. So that's their arguably, they're, they're the three biggest economies in the European Union other than Germany. So once they lose um, those large economies, we'll probably will see the end of uh, this European Union experiment. Yeah, oh, there's definitely, I feel, like I said before, that there's now, you know, optimism and, you know, excitement again uh, about the, the future. There was a, quite a few people who were sort of black-pilled at the beginning of the year, but I think t things have turned a corner now. Well, yeah, absolutely. Like, I think protectionism, I've, I've touched on it a few times, is actually one thing that environmentalists and lefties should actually be pushing towards Brexit. There was a Brexit movement in the 80s that was actually led by a left-wing party. And this is what the, the people don't understand. Like, when you bring in protectionism and you stop, you know, you just produce, you make domestic goods the predominant uh, use for the economy and stop importing goods from all over the world. You actually stop a lot of carbon dioxide being emitted out into the earth. And then for, um, another result from that is if you're buying local goods, you're supporting local jobs, you're supporting the local economy, and it actually makes goods cheaper in the long run. Yes, your dollar may be a little bit weaker, but you'll be buying goods that are actually a lot cheaper, and that's what they're finding in England. And the world hasn't turned on its head, which they said would happen, and England's actually doing incredibly well. Well, we'll keep doing our bit here in the, the alternative media. I'm um, looking forward to more of your commentary at videos and articles uh, on the Unshackled. Uh, they've uh, been, been quite a welcome addition to our, our growing platform. Yeah, thanks, Tim. I'm, uh, I'm excited. Um, I've got a few uh, great videos in the works and a lot of work to, uh, to do in the future. And we'll chat again soon. Thanks, Tim. And that's the show for today. As I've mentioned previously, I'm serving a 30-day ban on Facebook, so I'm not spending much time on the platform. So I'm investing more of my time on free speech social media, which The Unshackled has a growing presence on. We are on gab.ai slash The Unshackled. We also are on Minds at minds.com slash the underscore unshackled. We also have a MeWe page at mewe.com slash p slash The Unshackled. And we also have our growing Telegram channel channel on the encrypted messaging service at t.me slash the unshackled. Remember that we rely on the financial support of you, our followers, to bring you all the content and news that we do. You can pledge over at patreon.com slash the unshackled or directly via paypal.me slash the unshackled. We also have our premium membership option on our website, theunshackled.net slash support options slash premium membership. And thank you to all those who continue to contribute on a regular basis it all helps us so thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next show thanks for tuning in to the unshackled waves please visit the unshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show don't forget to pick up your free ebook at the unshackled battlefield.net and keep checking out the unshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary